Hello and welcome to this edition to the Art and Mind Village Chat. I'm Fred Johnson, Community Engagement Specialist at the Strat Center for the Performing Arts. Happy to be with you again. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, this Village Chat is a real opportunity for the uh, science and uh, research and art community to come together to have a shared conversation and expand the community's understanding of the importance of arts in all of its many ways uh, as a modality for health, well-being, and in many instances, healing. Uh, today, we are specifically talking about the journey of art as a modality to support the health and well-being of our veterans. As always, we are honored to be a part of this collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, their uh, Art and Mind Lab, and I'm honored always to co-host with Ms. Susan Magsamon, who is the Executive Director of, of that wonderful organization. Really excited today, Susan, to be able to uh, have this conversation. This series that we're doing is really focused on specific research projects that have been done. Um, our last series, we were focused on conversations with artists. And this time we're really combining and um, specifically talking about research projects that are done and quantifiable uh, information, um, science and research around the, the healing uh, elements of the arts and well-being elements of the arts. And we are honored to have with us today folks who are experts in that area, who do that work every day, who are involved in both the, uh, the research and the artistic components. We, uh, this group represents art therapists, uh, art organizations from the community, representatives from the art and science community, representatives from the National Endowment for the Arts and Americans for the Arts, and veterans who bridge the gap of both. So uh, I will quickly introduce each of them, and then you'll have the opportunity to learn more as we move forward. Um, Ms. Marilee Jorn, uh, who is a, a, an arts therapist. Ms. Natalie Quintana, who is a music therapist. Susan Mag Salmon, who of course I've already introduced. Ms. Nikita Wilson, who is a veteran artist and really a voice of veteran leadership in our community. Ms. Jennifer Harmon, who is also a veteran and a specialist in storytelling and the writing of story. Um, and Mr. Bill O'Brien, who uh, really is at the very, very forefront in terms of the scientific work and the fusion of, uh, of the community and the clinic working together uh, and so strongly represents the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, it's really, really exciting. So we will begin this journey. I'll turn it over to you, Susan, and let's talk about the story and the essence of creative forces. Thanks, Fred. It's really great to be here again with you. Um, I've known a little bit about creative forces for a number of years, and one of the things that has always struck me is the compassion and humanity that creative forces has brought to the whole military. Um, you know, we talk a lot about veterans, but there's also active military and their families involved in creative forces. So I'm very excited to be able to um, offer to our community more information about this amazing group of people who serve our country and also who we're trying to better serve. So with that, let me introduce you to Bill O'Brien. Uh, Bill, thanks for joining us today. It's really wonderful to see you and to have you share more about Creative Forces. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Susan. It's always, uh, it's always nice to be in conversation with the Arts and Mind Lab. Uh, so, um, my name is Bill O'Brien. I'm the uh, Senior Advisor for Innovation and the Director for Creative Forces for the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, be able to show a little bit more about Creative Forces. And so the, the mission of Creative Forces is to support military connected populations um, in regards to advancing their health, quality of life, and wellness uh, in both clinical and community settings. And uh, it started out really tightly focused on supporting service members, active duty service members with uh, PTSD and um, traumatic brain injuries. So the invisible wounds of war or the signature wounds of the, the most recent wars. Um, since then, it's expanded quite a bit. It started out in a, as a partnership uh, with the Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center and 
uh, more particularly the National Intrepid Center for Excellence, which is a, a laboratory of healing, hope, and learning uh, for these types of wounds. Um, and uh, what I'd say is that the, the partnership really came out of a, a strong commitment that the agency had in 2009 when we um, established the Innovation Office to understand what the role of arts could be, what the impacts and benefits of arts could be in very specific applications, maybe outside of the way that the National Endowment for the Arts has traditionally funded arts. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've come from theater, of theater and ballet and, and opera and film. Um, but we also wanted to really explore what is the role of the arts in other parts of American life, including arts and health, creativity in the brain, learning, et cetera. Um, so, as the program evolved, um, again, we started at Walter Reed um, and then we um, expanded to include both the clinical programs that we started with, uh, which included creative arts therapies embedded in a, an integrative care approach, uh, but also um, looking at community-based uh, arts engagement and the role and the value that they could have. It's sort of taking this patient-centered view and really thinking about it as a patient to person centric approach where uh, we can think about all hands on deck and what we all can contribute to this uh, broader effort. Um, so the three major components of Creative Forces are the clinical programs. Um, we'll hear from some of our clinicians uh, a little bit later. And the community programs, uh, Fred and his folks have been very uh, key partners in, in those efforts. And then capacity building for both of those programs. Um, as I mentioned, we started at Walter Reed. We're now in uh, 13 uh, DOD and VA clinics across the United States. Um, there's a lot of research happening um, that uh, is advancing our understanding of what the physical, emotional, and social benefits of creative arts therapies in medical treatment. Uh, we have 19 published uh, articles on that. Um, there's really more uh, to say about research and we have time to cover here. And I think we're gonna come back and, and talk more specifically about that with some of our clinicians who are sort of in the rooms where, uh, where, where these medical treatments and, and where the research is taking place. Um, but you can go to creativeforcesnrc.arts.gov. Uh, that's a national resource center that we're just now standing up, but the, the research uh, content is, is, is already loaded there and, and um, people are more than welcome to go and and have a look. Uh, you can spend a lot of time learning as much as you have time to dedicate about uh, the research that's happening. Uh, I'd mentioned on the community side, uh, we started by staging summits and uh, around each of the clinical sites that we've established. Um, and uh, the summits, the purpose of the summits are really to start to create um, relationships and, and potential collaborations between our clinical partners and some of the community assets that uh, surrounded them. Um, so often we heard from uh, our networks on the community arts side who really wanted to support more uh, uh, effectively and, and, and um, uh, they, they felt they had so much to provide, uh, but they didn't know how to connect. So we wanted to help sort of set the table and, and create a convening so these conversations could start to happen. Then we funded projects around each of these sites that grew out of the conversations where we recognized or identified some of the challenges and opportunities that might be pursued in community arts engagement um, types of efforts. And we've done some um, pretty robust program evaluation and case studies. We've got 15 of those reports uh, that we're now studying to help guide future investments. We're planning on announcing a national subgranting program that will open this up to communities across the United States uh, and I think that uh, I have a cat who's very interested in, in applying, it sounds like. Um, and uh, again, the clinical side, uh, this is sort of a representation of how the creative arts therapists are embedded uh, typically in these programs as a required part of treatment. So it's not an extracurricular activity that, that the service members of veterans typically choose if they want to, but it's something that's presented to them whether they thought it was something they, they would get uh, something out of or not. And that's been a really interesting experience, even for me to watch so many of these uh, service members, um, men and women, who thought that uh, a paintbrush or a guitar was the farthest thing from, from what they needed, um, 
who were surprised to find that it ended up being a very um, important catalyst in their, in their healing journeys. Um, so that kind of wraps up the background of creative forces. I'm happy to, you know, get into any, any questions that anyone here might have a little bit later. Uh, and I think we have a video that kind of gives some background, both of, uh, the creative forces, uh, program that, that we run at the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as some of the community partners and some of the things that are happening in those rooms. While I'm here, it's one of the days I calm down. My brain stops working on all the other things that it thinks about, and I get to have fun. It's something we started about five years ago, offering art to recovering vets. This is actually as much therapy for me as it is for them, I think, probably sometimes more so. You sit there and watch people come in without much to say, not interacting with each other. And I enjoy when I see one of those people, three or four weeks later, they're talking, they come in, that's our goal. They can find peace here, growth, safety, camaraderie, and they can experience the arts doing that. It's that simple for us. I have met soldiers in here that they couldn't speak to you. What was their challenges? But they were able to paint it and draw it for you. Through art and music, we're healing. We are healing. And I said we because most of the time when the soldier come, the family, we're here with them. It's such beautiful work. And Bill, thank you so much for sharing it. It really is true healing. Um, I'd love to um, ask you, Natalie, if you would talk a little bit about how you work as a music therapist in the Creative Forces programs. Um, good morning. My name is Natalie Quintana. I am the board certified music therapy at James Haley Veterans Hospital in Tampa, Florida. I've been there for three years now. And the way create, uh, creative arts therapy functions at our VA is we are um, embedded into physical medicine and rehabilitation services. I primarily work as the music therapist in various units that treat mild TBI, post-concussive syndrome, all the way to severe TBI in emerging consciousness. So service members coming out of comas. And it's my role on the interdisciplinary team to assess, evaluate, and treat these service members and veterans using musical tools. We uh, receive consults and referrals from physicians or other members of the integrative uh, team and I primarily focus on diagnoses like TBI, PTSD, anxiety, pain, thing, things of those nature. Um, and I use music to meet various cognitive, physical, and emotional needs within these units. Music therapy can kind of look like a lot of different things. It's very bespoke. It's very tailor-made to the patient's needs whatever that might be. It might look like songwriting. It might look like music playing. It might look like creation. It might look like sharing music, listening to music. It's totally dependent on the needs of the patient at the time. I've got my own clinical space within the VA. I primarily work one-to-ones. I do a handful of groups. And of course, in the time of COVID, I'm also doing virtual um, individual and group treatments as well. I'm also very fortunate to be working with uh, community partners to continue to offer arts engagement after they discharge from our hospital and return to their, their homes within the community. Um, so that's essentially music therapy at the VA. Um, Marilee, do you wanna talk about some of your experience as the art therapist. Uh, hello, my name's Marilee, Marilee Jorn. I am a creative forces art therapist with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. Um, thank you, Natalie, you've covered everything very well. Um, art therapy at the uh, James A. Haley is a, uh, um, I'm working with mild traumatic brain injury uh, patients on a couple of different units. 
uh, it does range. Uh, symptoms may uh, look like PTS or post-traumatic stress. Um, there's also uh, um, goes all the way to pain management and then some people who have uh, more of a severe traumatic brain injury. So working in art therapy uh, allows for the implicit and explicit uh, information systems to work together to integrate uh, something that somebody may be feeling, not able to articulate into words. Uh, sometimes they are not sure how to describe the feeling. So uh, that can come out through the artwork. So allowing for that opportunity can be part of the healing process. So art therapy looks a lot like a, a session that you might sit in uh, with a counselor. Um, the treatment planning is individual. So uh, maybe somebody who's just trying to work on interpersonal inter interpersonal relationships, uh, that communication uh, with their spouse or with friends. Um, it may be uh, that they are trying to work through or reconcile a difficult situation. So, so the art allows for them to engage in that and for their brain to um, create new neural pathways to uh, bring that implicit information uh, that may not have words to an explicit level where they're able to process it. It's such, it's such great work. And I, I working with the community and working with Fred too has been fantastic. Being able to do things with uh, um, veterans in the community, seeing them go into uh, places like the Morian Arts Center um, or participate in the vet art span, vet chats, uh, it gives them the opportunity to, uh, to get out into social situations, to integrate uh, the arts into the community so that when they do leave our clinical care, the, it's not just you know, saying goodbye at the door, but being able to actually get into um, social situations in the community where they can continue to create. Mm -hmm. The work is so profound, you know, the work in the clinic where you're actually um, really trying to um, help to identify the art form, but also address a particular um, issue that someone's having at such a personal level, I think is so amazing. But then this link to the community to ensure that the work continues to be part of their practice and their healing, I think that is so amazing. It, it doesn't happen in many other areas in medicine where you see that explicit community connection. Um, Let's bring Bill back into the conversation. I'd love for the three of you to talk a bit about um, what are some of the impacts that, that you've seen um, for the families um, and for the folks that you work with. Um, I know that you track this on a number of levels, looking at the sort of um, recovery, but also thinking about some of the things that um, folks are saying about how they're feeling and, and what's changed for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really interesting. And I know the Arts and Mind Lab is um, looking at these very difficult challenges as well in terms of how you try to measure the impact scientifically <laughs> of the arts. It's, it's a little bit like trying to get a handful of jello. It sort of, it, it kind of squeezes out of, of, of your grasp when you really try to pin it down. But you do definitely see and sense uh, what these impacts are pretty quickly. Um, and I think one of the things that's come out of the research so far, we've been eight years into this now, and it feels like we've just scratched the surface. Um, but one of the, um, uh, a, really a series of research studies that I think is, is opening up a really interesting avenue of inquiry is um, related to how um, a retrospective review of, of about 290 masks, I believe, were first studied just as uh, an exercise in trying to recognize patterns and themes and coding those themes. Uh, and that in and of itself was sort of an initial study. Um, and then there was a subsequent study that then correlated those themes that were represented in those masks with other data that was collected across the, the medical treatment um, activities. So uh, one of the things that I found so interesting was that service members at this all took place at the National Interpret Center for Excellence. Um, so they were all active duty. 
um, but the service members who had been contemplating um, uh, uh, trauma-based themes like split sense of self, moral injury, physical injury, um, a sense of disassociation or scattered uh, um, representation of, of themes that, that were um, in some ways chaotic, uh, as opposed to themes that were more um, uh, using metaphor for uh, considering sense of self in a larger social connected connection in a positive way. So that could be represented in patriotic themes or family, um, who am I in relation to others, uh, was associated with more positive depression, PTSD, and anxiety scores. Um, so that doesn't tell you that we shouldn't have, have people um, explore those more uh, trauma-based themes, because maybe that's what they need to do first. They may need to confront and, and, and maybe in a visual way express something that, that they weren't able to um, uh, put into words, for example. Um, but when they do get to a place where they can really think of themselves in, in, as part of a larger, you know, it's, it's larger than you kind of a thing, mm -hmm. uh, is a healthy thing. And it's a way that we're meant to be as human beings. And for me, what's so compelling about that is that it instantly kind of connects to me what the impulse to serve in the military is. I am serving something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. It also relates to the impulse to make art. You know, who am I in some larger context? I think that's who am I is what uh, artists of every stripe and Hank Williams and and uh, Aristotle all you know sort of focused on. And uh, it to me that brings in uh, this sort of comfort level in understanding that there is a real connection between military service and art making that might not be very obvious at first. You know, we were the response to the idea that we'd be having this partnership with the military raised some eyebrows and they seem like strange bedfellows, but I think the research is showing us that that's the farthest thing from the truth. How we connect to something bigger than ourselves, especially, especially other people, is a key, I think, uh, experience that everyone has in the military. Uh, and it's also something that we always explore um, as, as a habit for 40,000 years or so now uh, in our art making. Yeah, it's so interesting. It, you know, um, I've been studying the work of Dasher Keltner, who is, studies awe and transcendence, mm -hmm. and this idea of being um, the world, you being a small piece in a very big world in the sense of how can you serve that and what does that mean um, is really um, so ancient um, yeah. and, and, and so important to purpose and um, meaning um, at such a deep level. Also, because you're working with military who are um, trained to be less emotional, I always think of the arts as being tapping into this emotional part of our lives. And Marilee and Natalie, maybe you could talk a little bit about the role of emotion and feeling and touching, being in more in touch with those feelings and finding ways to bring them forward, which I think is what I'm hearing. Um, some of the work that you're doing. And then the second piece is some of the work that you're doing is in very um, transactional in the sense that when you're singing, you're learning how to speak or you're learning cadence. Or you're, and so I'd love to hear you both talk about both this idea of getting in touch with feelings, but also some of the skills that people are learning um, as they're working with each of you. I'll start if that's all right with you, Natalie. Um, Susan, you, you really, nailed it. Uh, emotion rec recognition uh, is, is something that uh, is challenging as service members are, you know, they're on a mission. Um, emotions aren't part of the scene at this time. So when they uh, come back and, and uh, they, they're going from being rational and uh, fact oriented, um, the emotional side of it is, is um, something they've disconnected from in many cases. So being able to use the art to uh, go through and recognize those emotions, um, give them a word and be able to, uh, to describe them. Uh, the art has been helpful for that. Um, allowing them to use a mask, for example, like Bill was saying, 
uh, to, to, I have so many people that come in and they're like, I haven't done art since I was in grade school. You know, I, I don't know how to draw a straight line and I'd be a wealthy woman if I had a dime for every time somebody said that. Uh, and then they sit down and they start working. And the next thing is, is this supposed to be a visceral experience? Uh, the emotion just comes out and it starts coming out when they're able to describe something and then show it to you and go, this is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And that has been a huge uh, um, impact on me, just being able to, to offer that opportunity for somebody, but then to see them be able to take that and talk to their, their, their wife or their husband or their um, daughter, son, and open up that opportunity to talk about what their experience has been like. Not in detail about uh, you know, the events, but just this is what I'm feeling has been very impactful. Amazing, amazing. Natalie, how about you? As far as music goes and music therapy is concerned, I, I tend to present music to our patients and have them identify emotions kind of, you know, from an external perspective. What do you think this person is trying to communicate? What do you think mm -hmm. this composer is communicating? And then work my way back inside of themselves just so that they you know, have this ability to practice on uh, in a context that's not so personal mm -hmm. and building that rapport and then getting to where they're at, identifying their own emotions through their musical preferences, you know, their experiences, their, their what music are they listening to now? So that's kind of the emotion side of, of music therapy. And I can speak to the skills um, question also um, in that, we know that there is no one center that uses, you know, one, no one center of the brain that uses music. We've confirmed at least 10 areas on fMRI evidence, and I'm sure that there's more to come um, with more research. Um, so it's always very motivating for patients to use music, musical experiences to be working on fine motor skills, learning to speak again, um, increasing their breath support, increasing their ability to um, hold themselves upright, to be mm -hmm. able to move. We know that music is such an excellent facilitator of these skill building activities that are needed within these populations. So uh, music therapy is just so effective at mm -hmm. providing this almost lubricant to get them to where they need to go. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure to see that mm -hmm. in action as well. That's a great word, a lubricant. Um, that's a great mm -hmm. word. And you know, as my as I understand it, that these modalities work together. So someone might be doing visual art and music and movement or expressive writing. Um, mm -hmm. Phil, I'm going to give you the last question. Um, can you bring kind of bring your perspective on what you've seen? as the impact kind of when you zoom out and look at this across all of the facilities that you've worked with? Yeah, you know, I think uh, what, it, what it does for me uh, is really change my whole perspective on what is the arts, <laughs> who is an artist and why do they pursue making art? Um, I, I had spent a lifetime in the arts. I produced theater, I was on stages, I, uh, produced on Broadway, um, and then I, I was a funder of the arts for quite a while, and I, I thought of the arts as something that took place in the arts sector or in the nonprofit arts world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, it really has kind of reawakened the idea that everyone is born an artist. <laughs> uh, Four-year-olds are all artists. Uh, I think Picasso has a quote that says, we're all artists at age five or something. And, and some of us have to work really hard to stay artists, you know, by the time we're 20 or so. Um, so I think that uh, for me, the most profound thing is how it kind of reawakens and reconnects some of the basic um, ideas of why we pursue art and how it connects to other things. You know, you'd mentioned the sense of awe 
uh, I can't, I couldn't help thinking about Sebastian Younger's book, Tribe. Uh, he was tribes. He was a uh, uh, embedded in um, in Afghanistan on on, on multiple um, uh, missions and um, experienced PTSD. And as a journalist, helped us understand what he was going through. And he had to talk to anthropologists who basically were saying we're wired to be connected. Like you know, he was trying to understand why did he feel more at home with a company of people who knew they were going to be attacked every morning at 5 a.m. than he was when he came back. Um, and part of it was just not having that tight social connection in ways that we're wired to be. Mm -hmm. uh, a. Brown in The Science of Belonging and uh, Eric Kendall in The Sense of Emotion and Memory and, and how when a memory is formed, if it's connected to emotion, it may be preserved into a long-term memory and won't go away very quickly. Again, you know, when you're when you have an aha as you're making art or experiencing art, I think it creates and builds memories around things that really feel like they matter to us, even if we don't understand exactly why. So, you know, visual arts in the act of creating or even in the act of engaging, um, whether it's visual arts or music or movement and dance, um, I think reawaken something that's very primal in us in, in terms of how we experience the world, how we perceive it, how we make sense of it. Um, and I think for me, what's always been so meaningful about this program is how um, it's being applied to respond to an issue that society cares a lot about. And I think uh, considering art as a utility that can be leveraged in that way is really exciting. And I, I think for me, it can teach us how we can aim that uh, capability in other places. You know, uh, there's other trauma exposed populations, whether it's related to disaster relief or substance abuse, or, you know, we might be able to create this, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of like an empathy ray gun or something that we can aim somewhere else as long as we really understand what we're aiming at, we understand what those issues are, and we have a kind of a strategic and intelligent response, and, and then we measure whether or not what we're doing is, is having an impact or not. So I love that approach and I really love the work that the creative arts therapists are doing. Mm -hmm. Folks in the community like Fred and, and Jennifer and Nikita. Um, the other thing about creative forces that I'll just mention is that it's a really unique way for uh, clinically based arts interventions and community based arts interventions to be in conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen very naturally and some, you know, sometimes they're trying to keep very clear <laughs> narratives about what distinguishes them apart from one another. But in this case, we're all sort of um, understanding what our role and what our contribution can be for this person uh, or this patient or this family member. And uh, I think it really kind of broadens uh, the scope of, you know, again, what is art? <laughs> Who's doing it? Why are we doing it? Uh, and, and that becomes a really interesting bunch of answers that we can continue to explore. And I would add, and where are we doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And so where do we show up as whole people in different environments? And, it, and we, we do, whether you're in the clinic or in the community, um, you know, this idea around um, uh, held emotion and embodied cognition, I think is so interesting in this work too, because you know, oftentimes the unconscious has something that hasn't risen above. And I hear both of you in talking about your work, and I want to hear Jennifer and Nikita talking about their work, um, that this idea of the unconscious being um, made visible in some of these forms. And so we have so much knowledge in us that we sometimes don't have ways to get out. And I think the arts do that so well as well. Um, so Fred, on a local or regional level, You've been working for the last couple of years with Vet Art Span. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? And then um, uh, I'd love to hear Nikita and Jennifer talk a bit about their work as well. Sure. Um, I, you know, Vet Art Span was, we were one of the 11 uh, community demonstration projects that were funded uh, to begin to have a conversation and, and really explore and understand ways that. Uh, the community could work in support of the work that was being done in the clinical setting, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because as Marilee and, and Natalie so eloquently said, I mean, you know, there's things that happen in the clinic and then what happens when the 
when the when the veteran or when the when the military person leaves that clinical setting how do they continue their creative experience and so that's kind of one of the elements but uh, one of the most important elements that I think was really outlined when we began to have a conversation about how does the community support the clinical setting for veterans and military active military active military folk and their families is the fact that uh, you have to have a premise from which, which to work. I mean, and being both a veteran and being um, an arts and somewhat of an arts administrator as well, it's interesting to kind of be in the midst of all that and not try to pattern that based upon what my own experiences were, but to really recognize that there are so many veterans who don't necessarily connect with the VA hospital, but they're trying to find their way back into, you know, really being infused into a community that doesn't really understand the military and the veteran experience. So I feel that one of the most powerful uh, foundations for that were, were these regional meetings that the NEA and Department of Defense and Americans for the Arts, it gave us an opportunity, folks who were involved in art therapy and community organizations that were interested who did artistic work to have a conversation with the general community to find out what are the things that it feels like works when you have a conversation about art and veterans, what are the challenges that are faced, what are the some of the needs uh, and desires of members of the veteran community in terms of, of feeling like there's a greater opportunity for integration. So there's the medical model, there's the medical piece, and then there's the, the, the community at large. And then there's the, the community that since 1973, many people didn't have family members that have been involved in the military experience because the draft ended. So what we did in terms of creating Vet Art Span is from that regional meeting where we listened to the community, we listened to the, the the scientific experts, the art therapists, uh, those of us who represented art, arts organizations, we shared uh, what our challenges were, for instance, in terms of convincing or more clearly articulating to our institutions why it's important to do this. And so we took all of those elements and decided, well, first and foremost, veterans need to be able to tell their own story. Veterans need to be able to hurt here, to, to be able to articulate what their experiences are and not feel like they're being judged in a safe environment. Uh, those of us in the art community need to more clearly understand and work and be more aligned with folk who are doing specific art therapy so that we can better understand how to support and likewise, how those therapists can understand how to integrate more clearly and we have a shared conversation. And we need for our community at large to understand what it is to be in the military. What, what is military life? What is this all about? Because there are a lot of families that don't understand that. And so hence we created a, a website essentially that was a point of destination for some of those conversations. I think we have a clip that uh, demonstrates an opportunity for veterans to be able to articulate what, it, what it's like to blow glass. Let's take a look at that tape. That's one example of one of the things that we um, that made its way onto our page. I get a lot of satisfaction when I see that the work has become emotional, that the work has become heady, or that work is coming from the heart. For me, uh, a lot of that art comes from, it's going to either come from your head, it's going to come from your heart, or it's going to come from your gut. Yeah. And if you can bring all that together, and I think that's what these guys can do, is they can bring all that together and then kind of express that. And sometimes it doesn't have to make it. Like, if it hits the floor, it hits the floor. It's the act of making and the act of working together that makes it important. And that's what I feel is my role um, in this whole thing. Art is healing, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, doesn't matter how you approach it, you're you're healing something inside of you. If it's not inside of you, it's inside someone else. Everybody on this planet is swimming to the same shore, um, and are rowing to the same shore. And if if we're not rowing to the same shore, the boat's going to sink. Like and that sounds kitschy and, and cliche, but it's it's the reality of it. And when I can get uh, an artist that's never served before in the same room with a 24 year combat veteran that's got you know multiple kinds of things going on. But guess what, that, that artist has had all kinds of things going on in their life too. Um, you understand there's a common denominator and it's gonna be this product that we're doing or this exercise that we're doing or this action that we're doing. 
in the conversations that are had just in that process because glass blowing because of its its inherent centering centering and grounding nature of 2100 degrees on the end of a pipe um it just it's disarming and the next thing you know you're just having a regular plain language conversation um with people with that are in your community that to me is the reason why we do it too it's it's healing for the military and the veteran folks and that's that's something that's that's so intimate to me that i can't even really express that in in, in, a, in a real with word like words aren't heavy enough for the emotion that, that is inside what that's for to be able to get you know matt and i to, to literally you know sing the same song i guess to, to say another cliche kind of thing but and just to, to do it in such harmony um is the ultimate goal for me yeah i mean that um really really kind of sums it up uh you know you, you had a, a a collection of um guys from the army and the marine corps and the air force and the navy working together uh, being able to really kind of use that camaraderie and some of those skills and some of that working close together that they learned and that they honed when they were in service, you know, working together to create a, a, a piece of glass at the Morian Art Center, which is a major art center in the community. Again, um, the gentleman, Matt, who spoke first, you know, he's, he's not a veteran. He's the d director of that program you know, who stands as an example and a voice to the community to say, look what can happen, you know, when we when we have a shared conversation. Chris Stowe, who's a Marine Corps veteran and a, a, an amazing human being, you know, coming together and creating a pathway for understanding, you know, vet art span essentially. And I think when we first talked about doing a website that was going to be podcasts and videos, mm -hmm. people were like, wait, what are you talking about? You know what? Thank the <laughs> Lord, you know, that we did that because now that's the game, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but the beauty of being able to have a point of destination, we have one of the things that we have on the Vet Arts Band website is a military cultural competency curriculum. It's a curriculum that was put together by some of our colleagues in New York City who are specialist social workers, also veterans, really sharing a conversation that says, these are the branches of the military. This is what the military is about. This is what boot camp is about. Here are some of the jobs that relate, creating an opportunity for our community to embrace and welcome our veterans in the community and arts organizations creating opportunities for veterans to come in and and, and really you know come alive um what we, we we've had a group of gatherings called the veteran civilian dialogues natalie participated and nikita participated and as a matter of fact nikita that was your first introduction coming to a veteran civilian dialogue will you talk a little bit about that and and, and also about art and how it's been an important part of, of your of your life Yes, thank you, Fred. Um, when it came to joining in and having those discussions in the Veteran Civilian Dialogue, it was something that I believe I was kind of called to because it wasn't just as simple as, oh, I saw a flyer or an announcement about it and I came. I had another veteran and brother who actually invited me spur of the moment. And I didn't quite know what the situation was. He just said, someone you know he's close with is doing this program and he wants to go support. I said, awesome. So I go and I find that this is exactly what I needed in the best way. And it's like you said, you think you're going into something and you don't see the correlation. Why would sitting and talking with other people be helpful to what's going on inside of me and how can that conversation in conjunction with sharing our art heal me in the deepest way? Well, I found that sometimes even just to be in the space, in the energy around people who are willing to share, who are willing to speak, can help you to think about things that you didn't consider before, to mm -hmm. see the connection that I've heard mentioned here so many times that is so mm -hmm. necessary because a lot of times we feel so alone and so misunderstood, especially as veterans and military service members. And you go into this room with mostly veterans, but also with civilians, and you find that somebody else does understand me. And I am heard. That is so important to know that I am being heard. And that was a very big thing about our gatherings. And then we went from this very deep and valuable and healthy conversation to a point of just beautiful art expression. And with the drums playing and with 
people dancing and we're singing. Next thing you know, we join all our different gifts together, all our different passions together. And everyone is uplifted. Everyone's on their feet and they're singing and they're dancing. And we're celebrating ourselves and we're celebrating our art. And that was something that I said, I can't stop. I have to keep coming back. And that's what I did. So with each opportunity, we saw some different level of growth, some other thought that was provoked. It could be something as simple as a lyric in a song, like Natalie talks about with art therapy. There's something that seems so unrelated that can help you to find that answer to that question that you've had for so long. And those are the type of experiences that I've had and continue to have even as I reflect on them. So just, it just helped me to understand that one, I'm not alone, that two, I am heard, and three, this expression needs to come out of me so that I can even see deeper into me and see my connection with everyone else. That's fantastic. We we had the opportunity also uh, during the year to collaborate with a, an amazing choreographer and an amazing dance company from Los Angeles, the Diavolo uh, Dance Company. And Jennifer, that's really kind of where you entered the participation. Um, and so not only did we have uh, Nikita, who, who you know, who's from the Army, and 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 Jennifer, who's from the Navy, and myself, who's from the Marine Corps, but we, we working with Diavolo, we were able to put together a dance ensemble made up of veterans, many of whom had never moved before. So we didn't call it a dance experience, we called it a movement experience. And the Diavolo Dance Company, this world-class, um, amazing dance company, and then community professional or, or, or aspiring uh, dancers in the community came together as the veteran civilian dance ensemble. And I'll, Jennifer, I'll give you the opportunity to talk about the experience for you and then how that even opened up some doors for you to work with the VA. And I will say that also Marilee Jorn um, and, and Natalie were in, involved in this national showcase that has been happening for years of veterans art. So the veteran civilian dance ensemble was able to perform collectively uh, in conjunction with um, of artists from the VA hospital in Tampa and artists from the VA hospital in uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. So the James Haley VA hospital and the Bay Pines uh, VA hospital came together. They had never kind of formally collaborated together in a performing arts center, our performing arts center, community, community. Okay. So you have veterans and civilians working with a professional dance company, working with art therapists, working with veteran artists from two VA hospitals in the community, coming together to do a presentation. And out of that long, long, long experience, Jennifer Harmon became a part of that ensemble and also her artistry came to the forefront. So Jennifer, please share that with us. Yes, thank you, Fred. That was quite an introduction. Um, yeah. <laughs> so for me, um, I actually grew up on stage. Um, I always did the choreography I was taught. Um, I sang the songs that I learned the lyrics to. Um, I, I did some visual arts and I painted the picture that I was supposed to paint. I never really knew what it meant to engage in creativity until I connected with Diavolo. And it's the craziest thing because I always, I always thought that I was a creative person. I never called myself an artist. Um, now I'm feeling like an artist because I came into this experience um, really out of curiosity. And through that, that curiosity evolved into really becoming my life's purpose. Um, it changed the whole trajectory of where I was going in my career. Um, so for me, the initial connection with Vet Art Span and with Diavolo um, was much more than just getting on stage and doing a performance, because I've done that. Um, it was um, like the, the gentleman in the last video talked about, you have you know, things that come from your heart, things that come from your mind, and things that come from your gut. That was a guttural experience for me. It was um, 
it, it kind of overcame me a little bit. You know, it, it, it made it to where um, I think I cried at every rehearsal. I'm known as being the crybaby of the group. And I'm not really much of a crier, which is so crazy to me. Um, anyhow, that evolved, though, like I said, into um, it, it kind of opened Pandora's box. And I wasn't about to shut that box ever. Um, so we insisted that uh, we have to keep this momentum going. And that's where uh, the Veteran Civilian Dance Ensemble evolved from or emerged from. Um, and of course, you know, the Strauss has been a, a critical component with making that happen. Um, so that has kept those relationships that we formed together, um, not just the veteran relationships, but the relationships with non-veterans in the community that bec have become part of our family um, they're like our, our little baby veterans that aren't quite there yet or whatever. Um, anyway, we've continued those relationships. We've helped each other through some very difficult times. Um, I've just wrapped on my second project with Diavolo. Um, anyhow, beyond the performing piece of it, though, um, I got my, my master's in creative writing. Um, and again, that was something that I was a journalist in the Navy, so I knew how to write. Um, it was the creative part that was challenging for me. So that was another way that, um, that I discovered my voice. Um, not only discovered my voice, but came to realize that people wanted to hear my voice um, or read my voice. Um, and that was very validating. So I've taken that experience in, con in conjunction with my experience um, through VetArtSpan, um, and I've tried to create opportunities in the community for veterans and non-veterans um, to be able to tell their story, you know, through writing, through uh, poetry, through song, um, and collaborating through dance and music and, and all of these other elements of the arts. Um, so really, yeah, I owe a lot to, you know, creative forces and that art span and to the Stras and to the VA and, and to everyone for kind of putting me on the right path. Like Nikita said, it was it was kind of an, an accidental, you know, happy mishap that we landed here, but we're not going anywhere. <laughs> You're kind uh, of stuck with us now, right? <laughs> you know, you know, on our journey as veterans to find our way home completely, um, those of us who a, a part of that pathway is the need to be at or to to go into a clinical setting, um, and 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 have that be a part of the the one of the threads in the tapestry of finding our way back to our fullness and finding our way home some of the shifts and adjustments that have that we have to make in order to really be able to serve our country um, to step into an opportunity where there are organizations like the NEA like Johns Hopkins you know um, who folk who are doing quanti finding quantifiable outcomes and really being able to scientifically tell the story and to help us to be aware of what happens to our neurological system, what happens to our mind, what happens to our ability to find patterns of emotions that help us to find our way back to our fullness, coupled with a community that more deeply understands and how to, the pathways to begin to support our veterans as they return and our military personnel and to, you know, to, to, to bridge that gap because there is a gap. I mean, it's a reality. We can talk about it, we can acknowledge it. Um, if we don't, then we're left to our own island to try to find our way. But, you know, art, whatever community you're talking about, artistic expression, everything that we see in our world beside those things that were created by our creator are a byproduct of someone's imagination. Those of us who have served and who have had to repattern ourselves are wanting to find our way back to our completeness and our fullness. And if that can be found through expertise of folk who can begin to reignite and reconnect so that we can find our way to a place where we can create together, to me, is really the power in creative forces to have this journey from understanding from a clinic, clinical setting to working with people in the community who can be voices and who can create safe spaces where folk can come together, learn about each other, and together we can be all that we can be is really what it's about.
You know, it's building and enriching our community through artistic expression. And this is not, thankfully, just a conversation that's being had with the military. This is a broad conversation that's being had across the board, that art is life enriching, that art does help to heal, that art is really a pathway for us to find our way back to the fullness of our humanity. And Lord knows that's what we need now more than ever before. So... That's my story and I'm sticking to it, but I, I really believe that that's the reason why this work is so important for all of us. And for an institution, an arts institution to be able to really be, to, to contribute, you know, beyond just being able to give out some tickets to some shows, but to really to, to be a part of a greater voice that says, listen, it, it, it would be okay if art was there just for entertainment, but art is there for way, way more and we're trying to help you to understand this is the value that it truly has. It's really amazing. Um, you know, I think the name Creative Forces says it all, you know, in some ways, it's just the perfect term to really bring all of this together. It is so powerful. Um, you know, um, Fred, you triggered something um, and maybe this is a good way to take us out in that, you know, this marriage of arts and science has to be equal partnership. And one of the things I think that science has done is to help explain some of these, um, uh, these um, disorders and diseases and states of mind that in fact are the exact right state of mind when you've gone through a trauma. You are traumatized. That's, that's what you should feel. And to, to understand that from a brain science point of view, what is happening in trauma? And then to start to look at what are some ways to relieve trauma, to change those um, neural pathways that have been so um, damaged and changed by an experience, or whether that's someone who has Parkinson's and there is you know, a neurotransmitter that's not working and we know that rhythm helps to move. So I think it's this dance truly between science and science doesn't have the answers. They're providing some new knowledge to the artists who have always known the answers. And I think helping the artists to maybe um, continue to refine the practice and to deepen what it means to have, the, what is the art of us? And so I, I just wanna thank everybody for your time today. Um, I'm so moved and, and I've also learned so much about what each of you do and how important what you do is. So I just want to say thank you. And uh, Fred, I'm going to turn it over to you to take us out. No, absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, there's an, there's an old African adage that says, you know, the articulation of someone's voice amplifies them into the world in terms of their appreciation and even expands their ability to be more and to do more because of who they are. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Natalie Quintana. Thank you, Nikita Wilson. Thank you, Jennifer Harmon. Thank you, Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Marilee Jorn. Thank you, Susan Magsamen. And a big thanks to all of you who share with us one of your most valuable commodities, and that's your time. We are so continually committed to learning more and to creating a forum so that we can really, really expand this conversation about the beauty and the importance of arts as a pathway for us to really to know each other more more fully to come together as a as a community to express our humanity and uh, to stay strong through these challenging times so on behalf of johns hopkins university and the Strad center for the performing arts and the national endowment for the arts <laughs> and for all the va organizations that uh, that are doing magnificent work um, we're honored to say thank you so very very much and until next time, stay safe, stay strong, and make art. <laughs>